I'd like to introduce poet Stephen Kramer, who comes from Boston, but as a child grew up in South Orange and then Brookside, New Jersey. As a child, Stephen fantasized himself as Zorro, or if not Zorro, his slightly older, adored cousin who would make movies with a Super 8 camera and freeze and resume shots so images would appear disappear, appear again, and Stephen noted over and over, I volunteered to disappear. <laughs> and in high school, he heard T.S. Eliot read aloud in the classroom, and he said, I understood a little, but I was hooked by the marriage of language and emotion. And then he started writing in college. And when asked why I write poetry, he, uh, Stephen said, because it is so difficult, and it seems to me the long-term dedication to a difficult task can help keep the self with its shorter-term needs in its place. And so it goes, and Stephen Kramer has been writing ever since. He's been writing poems and reviews that have appeared in literary journals and anthologies, and he is the author of five poetry collections. His latest collection is Clangings, just published this year, and he has been a recipient of a number of honors and awards, including Sheila Martin Prize, the 2005 Honor Book and Poetry, and he has received fellowships from the Mass Arts Artists Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. He's also taught at Bennington, BU, Tufts, and currently directs the Low Residency MFA program in creative writing at Lesley University in Cambridge, named by poets and writers as one of the top 10 low residency MFA programs in the country. And when I asked Stephen about one of his most memorable moments in sharing his poetry, he responded back that it wasn't directly, but he got word back that a friend had been at a conference over in Germany and had seen one of his poems uh, posted on the bulletin board at a, this conference on trauma uh, to be of uh, inspiration and um, that it was there on the bulletin board for all of those who wanted to share something with others. So it was you know, across the ocean there. And that is how sometimes words can affect. And uh, those went over to Germany. And we are happy and honored to have Stephen Kramer here today to share some of his poetry with us right here in Hopkinton. So please give a warm welcome to Stephen Kramer. I am going to read from Clangings. And I should mention ahead of time that it's a book-length sequence of poems in the voice of uh, of someone who manifests a condition called Clang Association. Uh, it's, uh, it's really um, a thought disorder. Uh, people in manic states um, exhibit it, uh, schizophrenics. Uh, I became interested in the, the idea when I heard of a number of examples from um, colleagues and friends of mine and felt very much that the Associate, associative and really dissociative uh, interplay between the, uh, the words, based more on sound than on, on linear sense, um, comes from the same wellsprings as a certain kind of literary language. And as I started writing one or two poems that, that uh, sort of role played the uh, what I imagined was the mental inner state of someone who would uh, uh, exhibit clang association of a voice and a character took over. Um, and uh, a book length sequence of poems grew out of that very quickly. The, ev the events of uh, Newtown yesterday has um, affected all of us, I think, parents maybe in particular. And uh, I felt a need to read a few poems. It changed what I felt was tonally necessary is not the right word, tonally relevant. And this is, uh, I'll read um, two, and if there's time, I'll read, read one after I read a few selections from Clangings. This is a poem with a, a great deal of uh, classical allusions, none of which I'm going to gloss. Um, 
allusions, I think, can be playful. They don't have to be described. Uh, I will say that the first, the title, Thonic, refers to the gods of the earth. Um, it's a very simple poem, I believe, in, in content. Um, a father worries deeply about his daughter. Thonic. Timed for odd noons. Eight sprinklers missed ten minutes each. A ninth soaks the hedge row of hues. Each May, a new price hike just to siphon up my underworld river. No coin for the ferryman. It's a pauper's gate to hell. In the den, three tweens, one mine, pass from hand to hand, their lip gloss forged from the mall. Grace is now, but in a wink, gray ones trading a single eye. There, Pre-hormonal, prideful, venereal nouns, fountainheads of argo pumped to flow disdain. About their future boys in the vestibule, shuffling their hooves, all trident quick moves in the car. Think too much, thoughts a venomed pelt. It's exquisite, yes, to touch a spider web to gold, but bread and water's better. Whoever thought it wise storing hope at the bottom of a jug thought best. Let it steep, sweet as the devil's food and Capri sun, these girls bid me bring them. Inside them, thirst and hunger pulse like PSIs channeling through pipes. Autumn and winter, Frozen Mars bars and log cabin syrup dripped on snow. Spring, stained eggs on fake green bed, a fake green bed. Summer, the earth and earth's daughter. By August, the girl's step heavy, tugged at. She's moistening her lips for Hades' kiss. Uh, and I, again, I will read just a few poems from this sequence. I think it's worth mentioning, however, that it's structured in a particular way uh, for those who might be interested in buying the book. And by the way, all my books are on sale for $10. Um, severely discounted. The first section is a kind of a census of his, of his very overcrowded mental life, inner, inner life. The second section, we, um, he wrestles with his family mentally. In the third section, there's a loss that uh, triggers the poems that follow. And in the last section, which I wish I had time to read from, but I don't, he enters the world more explicitly. Um, and uh, the world enters him as well. His first um, utterance is this. I hear the dinner plates gossip, mom collected to a hundred. My friends say, get on board, but I'm not bored. Dad's a nap, lying by the fire. That's why when radios broadcast news, news broadcast from radios gives air to my kinship. Dickie, who says he'd go dead if ever I discovered him to them. I took care then, the last time bedrooms banged, to tape over the outlets, swipe the prints off DVDs, weep up the tea stains where once was coffee. Not one seep from him since. What? You wander. Do I mean? Except for slinging my songs wayward home. How do things and people go, is what I mean. Now, Dickie uh, comes back over and over and over again, uh, particularly in the first section. Um, a uh, friend of mine 
who read the manuscript said, this Dickey character, he's, Dickey's interesting, whoever he, she, or it is. Um, and I felt like he got it right. So again, the speaker says in this one, they're all the same form, I should say. They're all um, four, uh, five quatrains, and they rhyme A, B, B, A. Um, my son looks at some of the rhymes, listens to female and tall, and says, Dad, that doesn't rhyme. It does in English. <laughs> I feel as male as I feel female. Dickie grins, no way he's telling. He'll never spare me his helping or fail to lift me to my tough and tall. With Dickie, I obliterate appetite. We all together decorate our waists, best belted bells test our protests, and we refuse to eat grisly meat if it's not rare. Our flesh is his, hers. If we split, we'd be mean fingernails. The hammers that nail boys, nail girls, given to prigs as to prone ministers. We made our cufflinks from handcuffs. All our blotters need to soak up blues arm in arm are sparse land avenues, dancers in our zippers, joints in our quaffs. Have us wear boas, make us spawn Hamlet fish, arrange us to clutch a Ken or G.I. Barbie. Still gonna bet you can't fork our brains a tine at a time. He loses a track, a track of his thought process very often. Uh, one of the challenges of this was to create poems that really are not organic. Uh, when he loses track, the reader loses track. When he blurts a non sequitur, it's a true non sequitur. It doesn't relate. Um, and for me, the, the challenge was to find a voice that could do that and still have some sort of emotional connection to the reader. Here he's thinking about his parents. I'm speaking with my mother's voice because she always told me what to say. Because he always told me what to say. I'm speaking with my father's voice. Once, there was a son and a father. The son beamed if father got daddish. Grounded, dad was a dry docked fish. Off his kilter, air his executioner. Twice, and toothsome, the mother esteemed so much Starlight got lost. Steam her from inside her cedar chest where hearts unlock boxes and wonder beats. Up close, Dad smelled priceless, gripping a great sea bass through the gills. Mom softened ills with menthol apples. To stand her, I withstood her caresses. Their co-stars staring from my talkies voiceovers, visors. Their soundtracks liven up my swat and splatter flicks because they told me what to say always. This one focuses on his, his mother. Black cats ring bells. I'm your son hearing them. Cats, black or not, are busy being cats. Don't sweat it. It's not about learning how to spin. A whirlpool through and through. You'd give geese goosebumps, get it? No, you don't get it, never got it. There you sit there, you being you, not one bitter more than you used to get used to being used. I tried. If only when I reached, you could. Ouch, inside a touch. You refused fusing. I was refuse. He rode me, but you sold me one cold wine. Life, vest, hurricane, weather vane. That's all I want to say. Don't say the drinks weren't drunk, mother. Yeah, he was wry enough in his gin. Liquor brokered old man, the twin you swam with, woman. So there. And I'll, I'll read one more from this book.
this is the loss. I wish I could read some of the poems in which there is some recovery from the loss, but I don't think I have time. Dickie's death feels all over me. I try not digging at the thing. He died before I could grow his hemlock seed. Boy, oh, the tricksters of this cemetery, long-sleeved shorts with their shirts off, can't tell a cow's dead till it's slaughtered. He was a sublime Halloween snicker. Bat dark meat. Never watched golf. Not much now but gum and minerals, blue pods, tainted entertainments. Our folder warps, drifts, frags, taunts. Everest ground down to soil samples. I've lost my sprite, my shot at distemper. Nobody's rabies can pillow this blow. Nobody's but Dickies. My he is O. Oh who once flicked hearts, a lamplighter. I could clang wish bells, break out a dish, but I know he's the headache at the base of my throat. He's left ice in my voice, foam round rocks where we used to fish. He's obsessed with fish, by the way. Um, don't know why. It's one of the other things about the, the poems that I found interesting is when I was working with them, I felt like I had some of the opportunities that fiction writers have to create a character about whom they don't necessarily know everything. I think he went to parochial school, but I'm not sure. I will read two more poems, and I think that uh, adequately uh, makes use of my time. This is one that uh, I felt like reading that I hadn't planned to read, but I feel like reading. I, th I think it, in some ways, addresses that question, how do people go, or maybe why do people go. It's a pantoum, and I'll describe the form of a pantoum, because it's, I think that maybe the poem can afford more pleasure. Uh, it's in quatrains, and there's a pattern where you repeat two lines from the previous quatrain and the next quatrain and, and, and then uh, introduce two new ones and then those new ones become our need to be repeated in the next quatrain and it moves on that way until at the last quatrain you got to bring back the two lines from the first quatrain. You don't get away with not reusing those. Uh, if you can't find a syntactical um, strategy to make that work, it can be sort of like walking on a conveyor belt that's going in the wrong direction. This is called Everyone Who Left Us. <clears throat> Everyone who left us we find everywhere. It's easier now to look them in the eyes, at grave sites, in bed, when the phone rings. Of course, we wonder if they think of us. It's easier now to look them in the eyes. Imagine touching a hand, listening to them talk. Of course, we wonder if they think of us when nights, like tonight, turn salty, warm. Imagine touching a hand, listening to them talk. Hard to believe they're capable of such coldness. When nights, like tonight, turn salty, warm, we think of calling them, leaving messages. Hard to believe they're capable of such coldness. No color, no pulse, not even a nerve reaction. We think of calling them, leaving messages vivid with news we're sure they'd want to know. No color, no pulse, not even a nerve reaction. We close our eyes in order not to see them. Vivid with news we're sure they'd want to know. We don't blame them, really. They weren't cruel. We close our eyes in order not to see them reading, making love, or falling asleep. We don't blame them. Really, they weren't cruel. Though it hurts every time we think of them, reading, making love, or falling asleep, enjoying the usual pleasures and boredoms. Though it hurts every time we think of them like a taste we can't swallow, their names stay. 
enjoying the usual pleasures and boredoms then. They leave us the look of their faces like a taste we can't swallow. Their names stay, diminishing our own, getting in the way at grave sites, in bed, when the phone rings. Everyone who left us we find everywhere. Then they leave us, the look of their faces diminishing, our own getting in the way. This is the poem that um, Cheryl mentioned that was posted up in uh, a German conference on trauma. It's an extraordinary experience to hear, to just hear someone come back and say, your poem was up there. It meant something to somebody. It's called The Work. Don't take the first line literally, okay? The Work. You can go now, out of your life's compromise with life. You're ready to walk beneath the sycamores lined along the street like crowds welcoming their own liberation. Yours will be a simple victory. One day, you'll choose to look out instead of down. So leave and keep leaving. Release what holds you back. Throw it aside as someone who's not thirsty anymore flings a fan of water from a paper cup, the water for a second taking flight, riveted with sunlight, air, and sound. For you, no wings, just the habitual grip of hands. But notice how the dead skin begins to molt and fall away. So even they grasp new things as new. This victory will hurt and even kill you sometimes. A few welts won't heal. Remember, as a child, how you stacked your wooden blocks and in a fit of serious pleasure kicked them down? It's bruising work you once mistook for play. Thank you very much. The moon is cold, the sky cerulean blue. Mars and Venus, close as lovers all week, move apart estranged. Walking home, I wander through a hilltop cemetery, past a newly filled grave, soil sinking at the edges. High in the sky, Orion, his belt cinched tightly from winter privations, watches my progress indifferently. I've had lonely nights when he would have been a savior, but this night my wife and children await me with hot food and open arms, perhaps even a fire to take away the chill. This is why the world grows cold, so we can warm it up. This is why the sky goes dark, so we can light it. This is why we all leave home, so we can return. The hero's journey is out and back, from cold to warmth, from dark to light. Each week, we are heroic in our own little ways. Each week, we deserve a hero's welcome home. Thank you. To Dorothy, in gratitude for drowning. My two sons squabble at the kitchen table over yet another tedious absurdity tonight. Too old for such childish displays of rivalry, they nevertheless swap sly jabs and snarky barbs. Oh, Dorothy, as I intervene for what must be the thousandth time, separating my adolescent progeny with a proven threat and gimlet eye. I think of you in gratitude. Thank you for drowning, for inadvertently slipping off that shifting deck, or what I more believe, for seeking in an alien sea a certain solace for your sorrow. Indeed, our history is a twisted path, 
along which family and fate intersect, a piquant minuet of impulse and consequence. Dear Dorothy, had you lived, there would have been no need to seek a second wife, whose issue would, in time, give this prosaic, priceless life to me and mine. Thank you. Holidays, holy days, bells ringing, lights twinkling, time for friends and families too, plans for parties, visiting Santa, caroling, all is calm, all is bright, but not all, and not everywhere. The sound of gunfire in Afghanistan Newtown, Syria, Palestine. We have the right to bear arms, to manufacture guns, to protect ourselves. The earth is red with the blood of the innocent, all part of the human family. Do they have the right to live? Peach and pear.